Thank you for joining this um, webinar. So we are very happy to introduce this first Fox Explore online conference and to welcome our main speaker of the day, Marco Lepisto, who is solution architect in uh, APAC in Japan for Google Cloud Platform. Our client solution and success team in Singapore have been working very hard last year with the Google Cloud Platform teams to enable the Sigfox and GCP integration. Uh, so today, uh, you'll get some insight of this integration, a live demo of how to set it up. You will have the chance to discover an end-to-end -end device example. Uh, so first with the Sigfox Sense it, and finally a live asset tracking demo using a PyCom, a PyTrack GPS, Sigfox Atlas Geolocation, Google BigQuery GIS and Maps. But before we start, I would like to make a special announcement uh, because we recently partnered with Google Cloud for Startups. Uh, the SMBs registered to the Sigfox Startup Program now have access to $20,000 uh, in Google Cloud Platform and Firebase, Firebase credits. Uh, so, of course, this is subject to comply with eligible conditions. So, for the companies interested in receiving these offers, among, among all the technical and business supports that Sigfox can provide, as well as partner benefits, I definitely invite you to register to the startup program. So, thanks again, Marco, for being with us today. Uh, I will let the stage. It's all yours. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. Just checking everybody can see me. We all good to go and hear me? Good to go. All right. Excellent. So thank you for joining the webinar. And thank you so much for Sig to Sigfax for organizing this, in this and inviting us here. My name is Marko. I'm a solutions architect at Google Cloud, and I specialize in IoT. And I've been really happy to work with our friends at Sigfax. And today I would like to show you tangible examples how you can use Sigfox and Google Cloud together. So with that, let's get started. I promise you I only have a couple of slides. I will mostly focus on live demos. So let's start from the basics. What is the Sigfox IoT platform or radio network and Google Cloud integration? Well, I believe it's all about data. When you build an IoT solution, yes, you have the devices. Usually you have many of them. They are usually small, quite low power, low cost, hopefully, <laughs> and they have sensors. And then you start collecting sensor telemetry, that's your data. But then the main thing from your business solutions point of view is to have value from the data, to have actionable insights. And then, of course, some of your devices may have actuators, not just sensors. So you stream the sensor telemetry somewhere, like the cloud, you analyze it, you make a decision and you can send a command back to your devices. And maybe some devices will move, maybe they will open a door, maybe they will start brewing your coffee. So that's the basic idea. So the Sigfox and Google Cloud integrations overall big picture is this. You have your devices, you have your business solution. You are transmitting data from your devices using the Sigfox radio network. Now, usually that's sensor data, sensor telemetry, but it could be also your devices asking for any updates, any new configurations. Then the Sigfox global network will pick up the transmission with the radio base stations. And the Sigfox backend system or Sigfox cloud, the platform, can then optionally transmit or forward your payload, your message to a backend system. And now in today's webinar, this example backend system is Google Cloud. And the short version is that Google Cloud is Google. And what I mean by that is the services we have in Google Cloud were originally built to power Google's own products. I'm sure you know them, YouTube and Gmail and Maps, etc. So Google needed scalable planetary scale systems for running applications, for having reliable, fast, high speed networks, for having very scalable storage systems, very fast databases, etc. Now these are available in Google Cloud Platform for everybody to use. And like you heard earlier, we are really happy that we have this startup collaboration now together so we can support startups together with Sigfox if they want to build something fun. So here in this example, then the Google Cloud data services are used to value the data, to handle and value the data. Now, let's start from the basics. 
we published the integration between Sigfox IoT platform and Google Cloud in January. It's all open source. The link is up there. And all the code is in GitHub, so all the code is open source. And the document itself is just a tutorial or reference guide how you can run through the installation. It's mostly automated, so it's scripted, so it should make your life easy to actually integrate the two systems. So following this documentation, you should be able to link your Sigfox backend and your Google Cloud platform in something like half an hour to one hour, the first time when, first time when you do it. So it looks like this. On the left in the architecture diagram here are your Sigfox devices. Whatever they are, they will then have a Sigfox radio and they will be transmitting messages. And then those messages and payload will be received by the Sigfox radio network. And then in the Sigfox backend, you can have an account. And in the Sigfox backend, you can configure so called callbacks. Now, these callbacks are then enabling the Sigfox backend to send the data and to send the service messages from your devices to a backend system, in this case, Google Cloud. So this is the integration. The link is still up there visible. So in Google Cloud Platform, we have implemented a reference system that is receiving the data from Sigfox. In practice, it's implemented by Cloud Functions. Cloud Functions are really handy because they implement serverless computing, meaning that you don't have to manage any servers. You don't need to leave any servers or virtual machines or containers running if nothing is happening. The cloud functions will appear. It's called event-driven architectures. They will come to life the moment Sigfox is sending some data. They will process the data, and then they will go away like soap bubbles. So the first cloud function that we implemented for this integration is called callback data. It has a simple functionality of first securing the connection. So there's a secure authenticated connection between Sigfox and Google Cloud. And then Sigfox can push the data. And then this callback data function, if everything goes well, will forward the data payload to Cloud PubSub. Cloud PubSub is our global message queue. It's a really handy place to store incoming data. You can ingest data at any scale. It decouples the data producers, IoT devices, and Sigfox in this case, and your backend system. So it's a decoupled architecture that's recommended. It's a nice sock absorber. If all of a sudden you have a huge spike load of traffic, Cloud pops up can then absorb and keep this traffic until your backend system has time to process it. But Mainly, it provides a real-time stream for you. So think of Cloud Pops up here as a data stream where you can collect all the data from all your IoT devices, and then you can process this data stream. However, the architecture that you're looking at here on the screen now is fully generic. It should, knock on wood, work with any Sigfox devices and any IoT solutions, because the callback data function will simply Take the data payload that Sigfox is sending, that your device has sent, and forward the data as is to Cloud PubSub. So literally the raw binary data that you're sending will be dropped into Cloud PubSub. So it should work with any use case, any business use case. In addition to that, your devices will have configurations. You will want to update those configurations. For example, how long do your devices sleep? update their functionality, what kind of sensor telemetry they should be sending, etc. The integration here supports storing and configuring your device configurations. We use something called Cloud Data Store and Firestore now in the new version, which is a very handy, easy to use document database, where basically the key is the Sigfox device type. You will see it soon in the live demo. And the value is the device configuration. If your devices are requesting configurations, the cloud function will notice it from the flag that the device has set, will get the device specific uh, configuration from the database and send it back to Sigfox and Sigfox will deliver this updated configuration back to your device. In addition to that, we also support service messages. So the top part of the diagram is the data plane with the payloads. The bottom part is the service messages. 
if the network has any service messages to send, like coverage uh, issues, etc., or your devices might send like acknowledgments. Thank you. I have received the downlink message. I am using the updated configuration acknowledgement. That is a service message. It doesn't have a data payload. So they are received by the second cloud function called callback service. And in Google Cloud, all the logging of all the integration activities go to Stackdriver, which is our logging and monitoring service in Google Cloud. Now, in addition to this very generic middle part here that should work with your business solution, you will need to have a solution specific or use case specific backend. Now, that's totally up to you, but here's an example. So, once you receive the raw data, you will want to process the raw data. With Sigfox, all the payloads coming from your devices are binary, because remember, you have only 12 bytes to work with with uplink. So, those 12 bytes, most likely you want to binary encode your sensor readings. So then you need to decode or parse your binary messages. And ultimately you want to store that data somewhere. You don't want to lose it. So you can implement a data backend system in Google Cloud using, for example, cloud functions that are triggered by the data. They can pass the data and store it in storage or databases. Or if you want to have a more complex data backend system, you can consider Cloud Dataflow. Cloud Dataflow implements Apache Beam streaming processing. So you can create data streams where you join data, you can split data, you can have windows on this real-time streaming data like the last five minutes, last hour, or last month. You can do aggregations, minimum, maximum, etc. After you have done this pre-processing for your data, you will want to store it in a data store. That could be the storage systems, it could be databases, it could be a data warehouse like Google BigQuery. And of course, I'm blocking slightly, the <laughs> machine learning is getting very popular. So in addition to storing the data and having a data warehouse or data lake, you may want to start exploring machine learning models for doing things like maybe preventive maintenance. Very briefly, I don't want to for you tremendously with this very wordy slide, but these are the requirements when I implemented the integration with Sigfox. So it implements the functionality that I just talked you through in the last slide, but the non-functional requirements were that we wanted to build a serverless system for the integration, no servers to manage, it's fully event-driven, stateless and scale out at any scale. But it's also very low cost scaling into zero when there's no data. So when there's no messages coming, the system will scale to zero. There are no cloud functions executing. So the build drops to zero as well. It's highly customizable and it's all open source in GitHub. Now, without any further ado, let me actually show this to you. And here's a QR code that brings you to that tutorial on the Google Cloud website. But let's now get to the actual integration. So here in the browser, you can see that we are in my Sigfox backend. And this is the device type of my example device. I can show you it's here. This is my sensitive device that I will be showing you soon. But you can see that right now in my backend system in Sigfox Cloud, I don't have any callbacks configured. We don't have an integration. However, in Google Cloud side, I have already deployed the backend system or the integration. So this is what the integration looks like in Google Cloud side. It's a couple of commands uh, written in the tutorial that you need to follow to deploy these cloud functions. So here they are. So we have three cloud functions. Callback data is receiving the raw payloads from your devices. Service receives the service messages. And there's an additional cloud function that is specific to this sensitive device that I will show you soon. Now, let's fix this problem. We don't have an integration. So let's now deploy the integration. So right now, we are on my laptop's terminal. I have downloaded from GitHub the Sigfox Google Cloud integration. And there's a command line tool there called Sigfox API. It's written in Python. There is a configuration file there where you configure your Sigfox backend API credentials and also your Google Cloud Function details, like the addresses of your Cloud Function when you deploy them, and your HTTP username and password for those. 
So basically this command line tool lets you interact programmatically easily with your Sigfox backend using the APIs. So let me execute this command line tool first against my backend and we try to list the existing callbacks. As you can see, we don't have any. So again, checking callbacks, none. All right. So let me now use the same command line tool and execute callbacks create. When you download from GitHub this integration, it has predefined configurations for the five callbacks for Google Cloud integration. So now I executed this. The script is using the APIs with my credentials, talking to Sigfox backend, and it says that it has created five callbacks. So now when we go back to my browser, I refresh the browser screen. What do we have here? Padam. There we go. So now we have automatically configured my Sigfox backend for Google Cloud integration. Let me briefly talk you through this. The first callback here that you see is the data callback. So any messages coming from your devices or my device in this case, in this device type, will be forwarded by the first callback on the list to that particular cloud function. And in practice, it's this cloud function here in Google Cloud. So this is the callback data cl cloud function. So this cloud function is listening and waiting for Sigfox to send messages. The second callback on the list are status messages from the network. The third one is data advanced, transmitting information like Sigfox Atlas estimated device coordinates, if you enable those. The fourth one are device acknowledgements, like thank you, I have received the downlink message. And if there are any errors, those will be reported by the last error callback. And all those errors and status messages are then locked in stack driver logging. That looks like this. So here we have an example of the callback data, the primary cloud function that handles the payloads, the logging of this cloud function in Stackdriver. So those are the callbacks. They have now been created automatically. This is the Google Cloud backend side implementing those. And the last thing that is related to the integration is this. The configuration management for your devices using Google Cloud Data Store or Firestore in the updated version. So here we can see that I have two device types, my two senses configured here, and they happen to have the same configuration at the moment. So that is in brief the integration. It's as easy as that. So you follow the tutorial, you deploy the cloud functions in your Google Cloud platform, you need to create the account first. The tutorial walks you through that one as well. And then you execute the script and you deploy your callback functions and you can start testing them. Now let's move on. I will briefly show you how the Sigfox API script that we executed actually works. Of course, it's a little bit longer than this, but this is the primary part. So it's written in Python. It uses the Sigfox API version 2, the new one. And I have a configuration file in the integration that predefines those five callbacks for Google Cloud integration. They are defined as a JSON file. They are part of the integration in GitHub. You can download them. If you want, you can modify everything, including those JSON schema for the callbacks, but the five default ones work as is. This script here is then reading these callback configurations, the JSON file, and one by one using the Sigfox API to execute create callback functionality against the Sigfox backend system. So it loops through five times in this case because the configuration file has five callbacks defined and it will one by one create all of those. So that's it. Everything is open source in GitHub. Now let's move on. That is the integration, but it's no fun unless we actually use it. So Let's now use the Sigfox Sensit example device, this development kit, and actually start using Sigfox using Google Cloud and using the integration. If you're not familiar with the Sensit device, it looks like this. It's very handy. The battery lasts months and months. So it's battery powered. It's a microcontroller. <clears throat> it has six sensors and, of course, Sigfox radio. And the device has different modes. It's actually really clever that it only sends four bytes in the payload when it's transmitting data. And it has different device modes. 
you can configure which mode you are on. And when you send the data, it's actually sending different combinations of sensor readings. So the schema, the payload schema of the device is quite interesting. And it's, of course, defined by Sigfox in the, in the open source documentation. So let me show you now a backend system using this device. The first part is the same. So on the left, you have the device. You have the Sigfox cloud, radio network, the standard Google Cloud integration with Sigfox that you saw earlier. And then the highlighted part on the right is a specific backend for this Sigfox sensitive device. Now, we published this one as well earlier this year. So the integration we published in January. And this device specific end to end solution we published in February, just after that first one. And the second one for sensitive device is relying on the first one. So it builds on top of the integration. So in practice, this sensitive example is showing you how to then handle the data coming from the sensitive devices, how to parse the binary, config, binary data from the device, and how to handle the binary configuration of the device as well. And then how to use Google Cloud BigQuery as a data warehouse to store and analyze that data. So with that, let's actually go to the demo. So let me show you again that in the browser here, if we go back to my Sigfox backend, we can see that now we have the callbacks configured. So the device type here is Sigfox DevKit 1. That's my sensitive device here. And if we go to the devices page, you can see that this is the device messages console for this particular device that I will be using. So the last time this device has transmitted something was about 45 minutes ago. So let's fix that now by actually transmitting some data. So let me go to the overhead webcam here, and you can see my device here. And if I double click this button here, it should transmit a payload. Currently, the device should be in temperature mode. So double click this button, and you can see that the little white LED was blinking a couple of times. We go back to the browser, and boom, there you go. Now we have a new message that has been just received from my device. The timestamp matches my time here in Singapore, and the data payload is here. I will actually copy this data payload to my clipboard. We will use it soon. So let's go now and see what happened. So if we go to Google Cloud Functions, you can see that here, the Cloud Function callback data has been triggered just now. It was triggered by the device sending the data packet, Sigfox forwarding the data, and calling this Cloud Function. Let's go to the logging of this Cloud Function, and let's see what happened. So this is the callback data cloud function. I'm refreshing the stack driver logs here. And let's get all the way to the bottom here. Here we go. It says, we have received a Sigfox message from device type Sigfox DevKit 1, device ID, this device, timestamp, data payload, etc. And then the next message from the cloud function is that the message has been published to cloud pubs. So this cloud function has taken the data as is and dropped it on the Google Cloud Pops Up message topic. That's it. What did the device actually send? So as you can see, when we look at the device data, EE0DA773, that's hexadecimal binary data. That's actually four bytes represented as two characters hexadecimal per byte. As part of the device example, we also published a nice command line tool for helping out here. So let's go to my terminal and let's use this command line tool. Just a second. There we go. Give me one second. The window wasn't refreshing. Okay, now we go. Here we go. So now on my console here, 
I'm using, I'm going to use the command line tool called Sensit Parser. This command line tool is part of the second tutorial that we published, the Sigfox Sensit tutorial with Google Cloud. It has a parser that lets you parse and decode the binary payload and also the device configuration of Sigfox Sensit. So it has been written to understand the schema and payload of this particular device. So what I can do is use this command line tool and say I want to decode some data and specifically I want to decode this hexadecimal string that the device sent just now. So here we go, boom, as you can see, this command line tool says that, okay, we have these eight characters, which are actually four bytes. We break them down into bits and bytes, the individual bytes and their bits are here. And then using the Sigfox Sensit payload schema, this command line tool is able to understand that, okay, actually those bits and bytes mean, in case of Sigfox Sensit device, these values. And then on the very bottom here, you can see the human readable representation of those values. So my Sensit device battery level is 4.15 volts. It's currently 57.5% humidity in my room here, 27.8 centigrade. And button alert flag is true, meaning that I actually click the button on the device to send the message. False would be that the device sent the message triggered by a timer. So that's very handy. Now, if we go back to the browser here, what happened after we received the message? The message was handled by this callback data function. It dropped the message in Cloud Pops up. But that's not all. We also have now the third cloud function, the device-specific cloud function that is able to understand the data payload from Sigfox Sensit. It's called Pops Up BigQuery. It was triggered just now by the data in Cloud Pops Up. So when the first integration cloud function dropped the message in the message queue, that message in the message queue triggered this cloud function. The task of this cloud function is device specific. It's able to understand the Sigfox Sensit binary schema, encoding schema, decode it into human readable format, and write it into a database, in this case, Google Cloud BigQuery. So let's take a look at the stack driver logging of this particular cloud function. And let's see what it does. It says here that the function execution was started. I will open one of these up. We get the data JSON there. You can see that the data here in this uh, line that I have highlighted is still in hexadecimal binary format. So it hasn't been decoded yet. But the next log entry here, if we open that one, we can see that now this cloud function has used this device specific parser, has understood the binary schema, and it has opened it up. We can see here things like humidity percentage, temperature, battery level, etc. Now, why did I do this? It's not very useful to store binary hexadecimal data in a database because then you have a huge pain, pain later on trying to actually use the data. So I think it's better to store the data in a database in a normal columnar format where every data attribute has its own column and they are human readable and human understandable. So that's what this cloud function does. It parses the data and then finally, it creates a row for BigQuery, the data warehouse, and it writes the data into BigQuery. And finally, the data lands here. This is Google Cloud BigQuery. It's our real-time data warehouse. It's very fast. The storage cost of BigQuery is the same as storing files in cloud storage. So it doesn't really matter from cost point of view if you store files in cloud storage or in BigQuery. That's why most of the customers probably prefer BigQuery, because in addition to storing your data, you can also analyze your data. So you can run SQL analytics in BigQuery at great speed. And nowadays, you can also run machine learning models and queries on top of your data in BigQuery without having to move the data anywhere. So that's really handy. So if we now 
execute a simple SQL query. You can see the query there in the middle of the screen. I want to look at this table and I want to see the last 20 entries. So here we can see that the last entry is the one that we just, or oh, actually it's the third one. Entry number three, another one of my devices sent recently. Row number three is the one we sent together just now. We can see that the battery level is 4.15 volts, temperature, humidity, etc. are there. So now that we have the data in BigQuery, then you can start creating business intelligence analytics, dashboards, etc. against your data. Like what? Well, in my personal case, I have done this using that same table in BigQuery that is growing in real time the moment my Sigfox devices are sending data. I've created a dashboard using Cloud Data Studio. Cloud Data Studio is a free tool that lets you create dashboards and visualizations against your data in BigQuery. And in my particular case, I live in Singapore. I have bought some lenses and I've heard that unless you store your lenses, camera lenses in a dry area in Singapore, they might actually start growing some fungus and some mold. So, so I wanted to protect my lenses. I bought a little dry box. I put the lenses there with the dehumidifier and I dropped this Sigfox Sensit device, my second device, into the box. And <laughs> we can see here that the humidity of my dry box is the red line. It's about 30, 31% humidity. So that's pretty okay. Whereas the control device that's in the same room without the dry box is about 60% humidity. So this is my personal use case for this particular system that I, I'm showing you here. So what I have shown you so, so far is sending data from the Sigfox Sensit using a command line tool to actually understand and parse the data. You saw the cloud function parsing it, writing it in BigQuery, and then we have visualized it in a dashboard. But what, up, what about device configurations? So in addition to sending telemetry from your devices, you also want to configure and update the configuration of your devices. So let's use this part of the integration now. So here we have Google Cloud Data Store, and now Google Cloud Firestore is implementing data, data store functionality. Anyway, this is a simple document database that we are using in this integration for managing your Sigfox device configuration. So you can see here that we have a device configuration. Let's say we want to update the device configuration. So, okay, this is my current configuration, right? Let me now copy this configuration to the clipboard and let's use the command line tool for Sigfox Sensit, that's part of the uh, device example, to understand what is this device configuration? So I took the device configuration hexadecimal string from the database. This should be what the device is using now. But what is it? What is this mysterious string here? Let's see. Aha. So the same command line tool that is able to understand the device data payloads also understands automatically based on the data, based on the payload, that this is not a data payload. This is a device configuration payload for Sigfox Sensit. It consists of eight bytes in this case. And you can see here that the command line tool is even creating a human readable and human editable version of the device configuration. So what you see here matches the Sigfox Sensit data schema in the Sigfox Sensit documentation. So, okay, that's fun. Now I know that this is the device current configuration, but how do I actually update it? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> let's use this command line tool and let's add one more parameter, one more switch, and ask this command line tool to output any device configuration detected into a configuration file. So let me execute this command now and boom. Now the command line tool has decoded the device configuration. You can see it on the screen. And it, it has also generated a configuration file from this, from this hexadecimal string. Okay, 
let's edit this configuration file. Now, of course, if you're working with Sigfax Sensit, you have to read the device schema, payload schema, to understand what these mean. But I can tell you briefly here that the message period value one means that the device is transmitting every hour, so once an hour. If I now replace this value with zero, that should tell the device to transmit every 10 minutes. So we edit this one configuration parameter, we set a new value zero, and we save the config file. Okay, now what? Now we need to somehow store this new configuration. So using the same, using the same command line tool, I use another mode of the command line tool, and I ask it to encode a new configuration string from that configuration file that we edited together. So let me execute this, and boom. Now you have a new Sigfox Sensit specific configuration that should tell the device to transmit every 10 minutes. Okay? If you don't believe it, you can, <laughs> you can try to decode it again. So let me very briefly run the decode again with this new configuration string, and boom. Now you can see message period equals zero. Okay, seems to be good. So what we need to do next is to go to Cloud Data Store or Firestore, and you need to know which device type you're working with. It's DevKit 1 in my case. You click that, and then it only has one configuration property or value. So I click on this. It's showing the current configuration, and I simply replace this string here with the one that we generated together using the Sensit command line tool. I click Done, and now our database has a new configuration. So that's good. How do we actually send it to the device? Well, in order to send it to the device, we need to actually use the device again. And there's a handy trick for making or forcing the Sensit device to request a new downlink message, to request a new configuration. You have to click the button short, short, long. Short, short, long. It was Morse code for something, which I forgot conveniently now. <laughs> anyway, let's try it together. So let me click, 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 long. And now you can see it's transmitting. And now it's blinking. Yeah, so it worked. It's blinking like that, meaning that now it's saying, I'm waiting, I'm listening. Please give me a downlink message. And you can see it here. Now the device has sent a much longer string. I will show you soon what it is. The uplink message has been handled by Google Cloud. It's green, meaning that Google Cloud has received the uplink message. And yellow down arrow, arrow there means that the device is waiting for new configuration. It's waiting for the downlink. So Google Cloud should be busy now, and boom. Green means that the Google Cloud has generated the new device configuration, has replied back to Sigfox platform. Sigfox platform has transmitted during the listening window the updated configuration back to the device. And the device has even acknowledged with the new message that it has received this updated configuration. All that happened in about 30 seconds just now. And up arrow green, down arrow green means that we were successfully receiving and replying with this downlink message. Downlink message in Sigfox means update the configuration. So let's see in the logs what actually happened. First of all, what is this awfully long string? If we copy that to the clipboard, we go back to the terminal, we use the decoder like we did earlier. Let's decode what this device sent earlier. It sent a much longer string, and according to the parser, we can see, ah, it sent both the data payload, which are the current sensor readings, and the current configuration. So the device is saying, I'm using this configuration. You can see that it's saying message period is one. I'm using currently, it was still using message period one. Okay, let's go back to the browser. Let's go to the cloud functions. Let's refresh this callback data cloud function logs. And let's try to find something interesting here. Here, we can see message published. Let me find it. 
there, sending downlink message. So slightly above that, let me show you this first. The cloud function received a message from the device from Sigfox, and there's a value acknowledgement equals true. Acknowledgement equals true is the device saying, I want to have a downlink message. I want to have an updated configuration. When this flag was received by this cloud function, it went to cloud data store. It requested this configuration using the same device ID and device type. Okay, it got the device configuration. And then this happened, sending downlink message. So the cloud function got the updated configuration. It's there visible and it sent it back to Sigfox platform as a reply. Then during the, during the listening window, Sigfox radio network transmitted the message back to the device and the device acknowledged happy, happy. Oh, no, I now have this acknowledgement. So that was device configuration management. You saw us request with this NC device a downlink message. It was handled by the Google Cloud function. We updated the device configuration in data store or Firestore. We generated the configuration using a human readable format of the configuration payload using the command line tool. And we sent everything back to the device. So that was pretty much it for the Sigfox sends it. And as you can see here, we have the data coming to BigQuery. And just as a recap, we are also able to gen then generate these dashboards in Cloud Data Studio. So that's good. So that was truly an end-to-end -end example with the Sensit device using Google Cloud. And how exactly does this parser work? So we use this Sensit parser command line tool on my laptop just now to understand the data payload, to understand the configuration payload, and even to generate a new configuration payload. It's implemented with a construct module in Python. With construct, you can create binary encodings quite easily. So here's one example on the screen here. When this Sigfox sensitive device is sending the data payloads, it sets a particular bit in the payload which specifies the device mode. And if the value of the device mode is one, it's temperature humidity mode. If the value is something else, it's another mode. So for every mode of the device, there's a specific payload schema. And you can see here how we have implemented, and again, it's open source in GitHub, uh, how we have implemented this parser for this particular device. So we are reading the first, I think it's in reverse. We are reading the first eight bits. Uh, and those are the value for humidity. The next ones are temperature with least and most significant bits. Then there's a button alert flag and finally a battery level. I think it's reading it upside down when the payload is coming. And the cloud function that is then receiving the data and writing the data to BigQuery for Sigfox Sensit has the same exact parser. So the same parser you're looking at here is both a command line tool and a cloud function as part of this Sensit example with Google Cloud. Okay. Moving on, the last thing I would like to show you in this webinar is asset tracking. Now with asset tracking, it means that you have an IoT device and you want to know where it is. Maybe it's moving, maybe you're doing some cold chain management where you're transmitting some ice cream with trucks and you need to know that they are not melting. So you put a small IoT device there in the truck with your ice cream that has a temperature sensor. And then you wanna be notified, you want the driver to be notified, for example, if the ice cream starts melting. So you need the sensor data to be transmitted out with Sigfox radio. Now, if the device is inside a truck, maybe you cannot get a satellite lock and maybe adding a GPS module to your device is too expensive. If the device is $3, GPS is what, $20 or something. So you may want to use something like Sigfox Atlas. With Sigfox Atlas positioning, you can have an estimated device position without any satellite coordinates. So any device that's transmitting Sigfox messages can have an estimated position. 
because the Sigfax radio network is MIMO, multiple in, multiple out. So all devices are opportunistically transmitting and all base stations are listening at the same time. Typically around three base stations are receiving the same message. So then the Sigfox backend system can estimate and calculate from these base station receptions where should this device be. And then when you have a device location, whether it's with satellite data or with Sigfox Atlas or both, then you have a geographical coordinate and timestamp and sensor readings as one. Then you know in time and space where your IoT devices are and what is their status. So next, I would like to show you a preview of the next solution that we will be publishing with Google Cloud and Sigfox. It will be asset tracking with Sigfox, PyCam, Google Cloud, BigQuery and Maps. And I'm happy to say that my friend and colleague Marco Ferrari, who has the best last name, last name ever, <laughs> who lives in Rome, he has been my partner in crime here implementing and publishing this solution. So thank you, Marco. Grazie mille. I think he's in the webinar here. Say hi to Marco. We are in the final stages of publishing this solution together. It should be coming out next month in Google Cloud web pages and GitHub, of course, for all the code. And here we, have, we are going to show you a sneak preview of this solution. It looks like this, same exact front end. So Sigfox devices, in this case, we use PyCam as the handy example device. Sigfox Cloud, the same exact Sigfox integration and the backend system that I'm blocking right now. So <laughs> we have a cloud function there, writing the data in BigQuery, like you saw earlier. We use BigQuery as the data warehouse, but BigQuery also understands GIS, geographical queries and geographical data. And then we can use things like maps for visualizing the IoT data. And in this reference guide, we are using the PyCam device. The PyCam devices are very handy microcontrollers. They are implementing MicroPython, which means that prototyping and writing code on the devices is very handy and very friendly. They are really nice microcontrollers with a lot of IO connectivity. And in this example, we are using the PyCom board, the, the MicroPython ESP32 based MCU, and the PyTrack shield below that. The PyTrack shield is an expansion board that adds things like battery power and battery charging, so you can run it with LiPo batteries for a long time, because the device also supports deep sleep. So what you want to do is run your device, if it's in a truck or container or whatever somewhere or in a field, you can run it for months or maybe even years from a battery by using deep sleep. So what you can do is collect the sensor readings, so read the sensor readings, transmit them out with Sigfox radio and go to sleep. And this device can literally go to deep sleep, which means that it shuts down the entire MCU. It just keeps a small clock circuit running on the Pi track that consumes about one microamp of power. So then if you deep sleep like one hour, maybe four hours, maybe even a day, depending on your business use case, wake up again for a few seconds, read the sensor readings, transmit data with low power Sigfox radio and sleep again. You can easily have your device running for months, maybe even years. And the PyTrack also has an accelerometer, so you have some built-in sensors to play with. And it supports multiple different rate, uh, satellite systems for listening uh, satellite positioning data from GPS, GLONASS, Galileo, ZQSS for Japan. So in this live demo, I will be using my PyCom device, which is that one there, but it's right now on my balcony in Singapore, sitting right there on the balcony, so that, so that it can hear the GPS and GLONASS satellites. So let's now switch to the live demo. So first of all, I have here a table in BigQuery. So this particular BigQuery table is for PyCom. But how do we get the data here? Let's start from the beginning again. We have my devices. If I click my device list, we can find my PyCom device. I click on that and let's go to messages. 
And we can see that the last time this device has transmitted anything was about one hour ago here in Singapore. Okay, so it has sent a payload, that's fine. How do we actually make this device send any data? How do we interact with the device when it's sitting on my balcony five meters from me? Luckily, this PyCon board has not only a Sigvox radio, it also has Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. So I'm able to connect to this device using Wi-Fi. So here we are on my Atom IDE, and we should be connected to my PyCom device. Yes, we are. So this Atom IDE has the PyMaker plugin installed. So with PyMaker, I'm able to interact with my PyCom devices using the Atom code editor or IDE. And this is the actual code of the asset tracking solution preview still that we will be publishing with Marco soon. You can see it looks like Python because it is. I haven't personally seen any difference between Python and MicroPython. It just works on the microcontroller. So this is the device code. We are loading some PyCon specific machine, machine libraries here, networking libraries that implement, for example, Sigfox. You can see on the bottom that we are implementing importing the Sigfox module. We are also importing the PyTrack shield module and a couple of sensor modules, for example, the three-axis accelerometer. And then we have the device code here. Basically what this device code does on the microcontroller is it wakes up, it connects to Wi-Fi in this case that I can actually control it remotely, and then it reads the sensor readings, let me scroll down a little bit. So it reads the sensor readings. And that's not the right part here. It's trying to get the GPS positioning coordinates. There's a configurable timeout value, normally 30 seconds. If it cannot get the GPS position coordinates, it will just set them as zero, zero. If it does get the GPS coordinates, that's good and it will send the GPS coordinates in the device payload. So some of the bytes in those 12 bytes we need to reserve for transmitting the device coordinates, the GPS coordinates. Then it will also read the other sensor readings like roll, pitch, and battery voltage. Then, because we have only 12 bytes, I'm doing some binary packing. So I'm packing the, using the struct module, I'm packing the sensor readings into the 12 bytes. I'm not even actually using all of them. And then we are simply sending there. We are sending with Sigfox and Sigfox radio the data payload. And then depending on the configuration, the device can either go to deep sleep, which means that it really disappears for the set deep sleep time. It will wake up automatically after that. Or if you're doing debugging, then it will not go to deep sleep. It will go to normal Python sleep, which means that you can still interact easily with the device. So enough talk. Let's now click run and see what happens when we execute the code. So now it's executing on the board this code. It reads the device configuration. I store it on the SD card. If we update the device config, it will update the configuration on the SD card. Now it says that, OK. I have the device configuration. It's using Sigfox radio configuration 4, which is Asia Pacific, including Singapore. You can see the Sigfox radio uh, range there, 920 megahertz. It got GPS coordinates because it's on my balcony. It encoded the payload from all the sensor, sensor data and the GPS coordinates, 12 bytes, and it sent the Sigfox uplink message. OK, that's good. And then it went to normal sleep, so not deep sleep. So now let's go back to my browser and let's see what happens. If we go to this device here, we can see that indeed just now at 5.58 local time here in Singapore, so one minute ago, we have received in Sigfox backend this data. And if we go to BigQuery and if we refresh or load the latest messages from the data warehouse, Loading. Let's see when we refresh the screen. Uh, 
By the way, let's also use the parser to see what exactly we sent. So I copy this to the clipboard and I will show you that we also have a similar parser for PyTrack, just like we have for the Sigfox Sensit, we have for the PyTracks. Give me a second. The screen is not refreshing. Here we go. Okay, now you should be able to see. So, as part of this upcoming solution that should be coming out next month, there's a device parser just like you saw for the Sensit device for this particular asset tracking device. So this is the data hexadecimal payload that the device sent just now from my balcony. And if we use the parser, we can see that this should be the data. Pi track sensor data received. And in human readable format, we can see here GPS latitude and longitude in Singapore, and then the roll, pitch, battery voltage, and wake up reason. So now when we go back to BigQuery, we should see here, let's reload the screen. We should see here an update. And while that's loading, there we go. Slightly slow internet connection. Let's give it a second. Here it's coming. So what happened was that the device sent the data. We sent it from the PyCom device using the Atom IDE. And then it was received by Sigfox Radio. It was received by the same exact Google Cloud integration. And a cloud function was using this device specific parser, understanding this particular example device, parsed the data and wrote it to BigQuery. And here we go. Now, after we reloaded the page, we can see that the latest entry in BigQuery is 9.58 UK time, which is 5.58 PM Singapore time. That's the same payload. We can see here latitude and longitude. Those are coming from the GPS data, the roll pitch and voltage, which are the sensory readings. And then very interestingly, in the end here, you can see Sigfox Singapore Unabis, the Sigfox Singapore operator, and then computed location, the other way, computed location, latitude and longitude. So those are the Sigfox Atlas estimated coordinates. So now in BigQuery Data Warehouse, we have both the estimated coordinates of the device, which are always there with Sigfox Atlas, even without GPS. And in this case, we also got the GPS coordinates from the device as part of the payload. So device coordinates with GPS were part of the device payload, but the Sigfox Atlas estimated coordinates here are part of the metadata, part of the data advanced callback added by the Sigfox platform around the payload when it forwarded the data. They are both written to BigQuery so that then in your applications and data processing systems in the back end using this data in BigQuery, you can always have the device coordinate. If your device heard the satellites, then the satellite information is there, the exact coordinates. If your de device was not able to hear the satellites, then Sigfox Atlas estimated coordinates are a backup or fallback solution. You still have an estimated location for the device. And then finally, what you can do is this. Here we have maps and you can see an SQL query on the left there. Just a standard SQL query with one interesting thing. It has geographical GIS coordinates. So basically we are interacting with BigQuery using standard SQL but we are telling BigQuery that, hey, these attributes or these columns in the database contain latitude and longitude data. So please treat those as geographical coordinates. In addition to that, my friend Marco actually figured out that if we use this coalesce function, which I cannot pronounce, <laughs> when we ask BigQuery, we have these columns for GPS and these columns for Sigfox Atlas, please use the better one. If you have GPS data, use that one because it's more accurate. If GPS data is missing, fall back to the Sigfox Atlas coordinates. So then no matter what, these SQL queries will give you coordinates. And then we can simply click this run button 
and visualize the IoT data from my device in maps. So here we can see two locations in Singapore, which is basically my house, our house, and my colleague's house, who was kindly helping us test this solution. So there we go. Asset tracking with PyCom, Sigfox, and Google Cloud. So that's, again, my device sitting on the balcony right there. So there we go. That was what I wanted to show. And thank you again, Marco, my colleague. Thank you, Sigfox, for inviting us. I really hope that you enjoyed it. I hope it was useful. I tried to collect some of the links here. And please stay tuned for the upcoming asset tracking solution that will be open sourced by Marco and myself in the next couple of weeks or few weeks. So thank you so much. Uh, before ending and closing the webinar, uh, I'd like to add a few words about, um, about the startup program because we had some questions about it. Uh, so for you to know, this is a program that we, um, we built three years ago uh, that is open to everyone, uh, open to any company willing to launch uh, any project with Sigfox, so uh, small and business, uh, medium businesses can access to technical and business support, uh, as well as a partner from benefits. Uh, we, you can uh, get in touch directly with uh, the uh, engineers from uh, Sigfox team and uh, yeah, experts from the Sigfox team to support you in your project. So, for instance, uh, the uh, announcement of this uh, partnership, with, with partnership with Google Cloud Platform was the opportunity to uh, to, um, to enable 20,000 credits for the uh, companies that are part of this program. So if you're interested to, to, uh, to access this offer, uh, you can, uh, you can uh, we will send you the, the link to the program uh, afterwards and you can uh, submit your project to, be, to get support in your, in your Sigfox project. Uh, so thanks Go again. Uh, thank you again, Marco. It was a very, very interesting webinar, very helpful for everyone. Um, and uh, I hope we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. I really hope that everybody enjoyed it. Thank you. See you Thank later. Thank you. Bye-bye.